Grace and peace to you from God, a loving God, liberating God, creating God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of talk around here about the kingdom of heaven. Not so much talk about mending our brokenness. And so, if I had to give a title to what I'm going to talk about this morning, we would call it Mending Our Brokenness. Or using a Japanese term, we would call it Kintsugi. Kintsugi is an art of mending our brokenness, but making it better than it was when it was broken. So why does Jesus talk so much about the kingdom of heaven? I was recently in a diner, and I overheard a conversation uh, with the two people behind me. And one said, a person said the kingdom of heaven is a great place. The other person asked him, well, how do you know that? How do you know that, friend? And he said, because everybody who goes to heaven don't complain, and they don't come back. As I said, the kingdom of heaven was a central theme of Jesus' teaching ministry. By the kingdom of heaven, Jesus was not talking about a particular place. He was not talking about a geographical location. He was talking about a particular level of human consciousness, a particular way that we think about things, a particular way about how we do things. Jesus uses his imagination in this discussion, in this passage. And if we read it closely, it looks more like a brainstorming session rather than a dictation or really a lecture or something. But the question comes up, who are the inhabitants of this kingdom? And to whom does the kingdom belong? The answer obviously is, we are the inhabitants of this kingdom. The kingdom belongs to Jesus, belongs to God, but we are the inhabitants. But there are always things in there that are going on, perhaps under the surface, under the surface. There are issues of things being broken. There are issues of things being hidden, things being discovered. There are issues because some things have great value some things are treasure. Some things have a history that binds groups together, even ourselves. But some things have a history of being broken, tossed, and turned. Perhaps a history or a past that we're not particularly proud of, or maybe a past that we could be ashamed of. Several years ago, I saw a movie about a particular mathematician and an economist. He was famous eventually, but his role to fame was captured in the movie. And some of you may have seen it. The movie was called A Beautiful Mind. Quite an old movie, but a good movie. A Beautiful Mind because the person's mind started to erode. He was a mathematician who worked out several formulas for uh, the Energy Department and for the Defense Department and for the U.S. economy. His name was John Nash. He eventually received a Nobel Prize for his work, but in the process, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, mental illness, and several other uh, uh, diseases. And so the movie makers captured his life in such a way that you could not tell in the movie whether you were in his mind, whether or not he was frankly crazy, or whether or not these things were actually going on. And for two hours, we went through that. And it took me almost 15 years to figure out when in the movie he was actually disturbed mentally and when he was actually living in real time, in real space. And this gets us to the point that Jesus asked the disciples, after he had given them these parables, and without too much explanation, he asked, do you understand? 
And they answer, yes. Many of the commentaries will say they couldn't possibly understand because we don't understand it today. Maybe not completely. But I would count that by saying these parables used to things as metaphors and as real entities that people were very, very familiar with. They were familiar with yeast. They were familiar with fish nets. They were familiar with other things mentioned in the parable. So at a certain level, they understood probably what Jesus thought they should understand. Other things may have been hidden, but we don't know. So what is the kingdom of heaven? It is a way of living. It is a thought process. The way we think about things, the way we treat things, people. Mustard seeds for sourdough, treasure hidden in a field, the pearl of great value, that's thrown into the sea and fishes of all kinds are separated into baskets. Surely, again, these are things that the disciples would be familiar with. And surely, they have not lost their connection with their Jewish teachings from their background, from their faith. And perhaps they were beginning to bring those Jewish teachings from their background together with the teachings that Jesus had. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, small, but can grow, but grow very slowly. It may be just easier to describe what the kingdom of heaven is not rather than what it is. Maybe this is easier. I remember several years ago when we were working on, on projects in the research lab, as we changed projects and went from one project to another, we would describe the new project in terms of what it would not do, what it should not accomplish, how it should not be. Because we thought that by telling people what it is or what we hope for, mm -hmm. what we expect it, it would limit their vision, limit their dreams, and limit their imaginations. And so let's try to see what the kingdom of heaven is not. It is not like the clothes and the stuff that we put out on the steps for Cherokee to pick up uh, when they come to us several times a year. It is not like the things that we have accumulated over a lifetime, never being used for more than 20 years ago. It is not like that crystal and that china that nobody wants, even when you're trying to give it away free. It is not like the hundreds of books that's collected across three different careers over a period of 40 years. The kingdom of heaven is not about a lifetime devoted to accumulating stuff that's no longer useful or desirable. The kingdom of heaven is not like a school where eight-year-olds are afraid to attend for fear of being shot and for fear of dying. The kingdom of heaven is not like a place where they are bullied, where kids are bullied. It is not where they face violence on their way to school. The kingdom of heaven is not like our oceans and seas and even our lakes and rivers that are contaminated with large amounts of microplastics. The kingdom of heaven is not like a place where hundreds of people go hungry each day, where hundreds of people are without housing, without food. It is not a place where we see selfishness, violence, destruction, and fear. It is not like that, but we see all of this play out before us. But even in these kinds, we're called into the kingdom of heaven and we do need to provide some measure and directions of how to. But suppose Jesus is not giving specific directions or details in this discourse. Suppose Jesus is asking us and asking his disciples and all of his followers to use in our imaginations to discover the possibilities that exist within the creation then perhaps the parables should be looked upon as possibilities. No definitive explanations, but wide-ranging possibilities. It is clear that Jesus' description of the kingdom, where everyone is invited, the foreigners, the strangers, the people of color, broken people, poor people, the sick, all possibilities. 
the guidelines are for people that fit into Jesus' commandment that you all heard over and over again, that we should love our Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and love ourselves as well as our neighbors. Jesus did not place limitations on what the kingdom of heaven is like. It was her mother's birthday, and she wanted to do something nice for her mother. She was only five years old, but she wanted to make a birthday present, a special present, that would make the birthday a special occasion. She climbed up the cabinets all by herself and bought down this bowl all on her own. She would fill the dish with her mother's favorite treats and present it to her as a present. But she slipped and fell, dropping the special bowl on the floor. The bowl crashed onto the floor and with it landed and being distributed in dozens of pieces. The five-year-old decided to cry as she started to pick up several little pieces. And as she was crying, she felt a warm hand on her shoulder. It was her grandfather who asked what had happened. And she said, I just wanted to do something special for mom, but I broke her special bowl and it cannot be fixed. The bowl can be fixed, and I know who can do it, said Grandpa. Let's pick up the pieces and take them to your dad, who has an art studio right back behind the house. When they got there, her father said, yes, we can fix the bowl. It will not be the same as it was before. It will be even better. She wondered what her father meant as she watched him start to work on the bowl. She watched as her father took blue and gold and lacquer and started to reassemble the bowl. In a few hours, she saw that her father was right. The bowl was beginning to look more beautiful than it was before it was dropped. Her father explained that he is using a technique called kintsugi. He told her that it is believed that when broken items are repaired with gold or silver or, or the like, the flaw becomes a unique piece of the object's history. And this uniqueness adds to its beauty. Kintsuki is the art of restoring something that has been broken. Restoring it with gold or with silver, understanding that it will be more beautiful because it has been broken. Jesus Christ means more to us because he suffered on a cross, holding it from the nails in his hands and his feet. And you will notice that when he reappeared after the res resurrection, the holes in his hand, the holes in his side and his feet were still visible. He did not attempt to hide the imperfections. One writer has commented that we get blisters and we get sores uh, when we are injured. But that happens because we are truly alive, not dead. He implied that dead people will not have sores, not get blisters. God knows that every one of us has some manner of brokenness in our lives. It may be in our past, or it may be right here in our present. God redeems us and brings our brokenness our stories into the kingdom of heaven in spite of our imperfections and our brokenness. Perhaps we are grieved from a broken heart, maybe a loss of health or relationships, maybe from choices we've made, situations beyond our control. We may sometimes see ourselves so profoundly broken that we don't know how things can be restored. Here is what the ancient Japanese art of Kintsugi can teach us about healing and about Jesus Christ and about our lives today. Trauma cannot be erased. We simply cannot go back to the unbroken state. Broken things or breakage cannot be reversed. Healing requires transformation. Kintsugi reminds us that God does not consider us disposable because we are broken. 
we are not to be thrown out with the trash. Restoration, repair, can make things beautiful. Shame and denial can somehow, somehow, and sometimes heal our, uh, cloud our healing process. Moving away from our own obsessions with our own self, and Jesus saw this as being willing to love others as we love ourselves. There is beauty in our brokenness and in what God does to redeem our stories. In the kingdom of heaven, our faith is a key requirement. God often calls us to do things that we cannot do alone and to things that we may not be able to accomplish even in one lifetime. But we know as we pray on Wednesday evening that the kingdom of heaven, in this kingdom of heaven, there will be ventures of which we cannot see the ending. There are paths that we have not traveled, but God is faithful and his hand will lead us and his love will support us. We cannot know, we cannot drift, as we heard a man in church this morning. We cannot drift beyond his love and his care. The Lord is able and the Lord will heal us. The Lord continues to require us to be part of the whole to be part of the body of Christ. The whole is indeed equal to the sum of its parts, but is greater than any one of them. Amen.